right, here we go. We have Tom Mesereau, one of the great criminal lawyers of our era, best known for successfully defending Michael Jackson in his 2005 case where he beat all of his 14 charges, as well as defending Mike Tyson, Suge Knight, Bill Cosby, and a, and a host of others. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Well, it's your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in West Point, New York? I was born in West Point, New York. Mm -hmm. My parents were in the Army. My father was a West Point graduate, the United States Military Academy. My uncle was a West Point graduate. My grandfather was an honorary graduate. Uh, and uh, I grew up with close ties to West Point. Got it. Got it. And I guess your father and your uncle wanted you to become a lawyer. Well, my father always said to me, if you don't know what you want to do, consider law school. It provides a lot of <laughs> options. And he was absolutely correct. I went to law school not knowing what I wanted to do after law school. Uh, I knew I had many opportunities to do something. You can go into business. You can go into government. You can be a prosecutor. You can be a defense attorney. You can go into private practice, big firm, small firm, your own firm. There's so many things you can do with a law degree. In fact, I don't know any other degree that gives you as many options as a law degree does. So my father was correct. He guided me very, very properly. Okay. And you actually got your undergrad at Harvard. Yes. Okay. Come laude. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Then you got your master's uh, in international relations at London. London School of Economics. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you got a law degree at Hastings. In San Francisco. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. You did, you did your homework. I did my homework. <laughs> I did your home. I did my homework. Okay. So you graduate from law school and then you started different things. You started trying out different things in the, in the area of law. And at first you start out as a civil litigator? Yes, I was with a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Hunted and Williams. The main office was Richmond, Virginia. It's a large international law firm now. And uh, I started off as a civil litigator. That's correct. Okay. And then you became a, a deputy district attorney. I became a deputy district attorney in Orange County. I was there for about a year. I was a real fish out of water. And I looked for something else. Right. And you said that very quickly you saw that prosecution wasn't really a good fit for you. It was not. And, and I, was, I was really touched by my first experience in the Orange County DA's office. I was assigned to the juvenile court to, as part of my orientation training, they gave me a tour of the facility. And part of the tour was looking in a window through an iron door into a suicide watch room. And in that room was a little girl sitting by herself, her head in her lap, not saying a word. And I finished my tour, finished my orientation, finished my training, and to my horror, I was asked to prosecute this young girl. It just was traumatizing. It was disturbing. She had been caught shoplifting in a department store. The case could not have been more open and shut. They had her on tape. She admitted doing it. Uh, they arrested her and wanted me to prosecute her for a misdemeanor. And I looked at her file, and she'd been the victim of physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. She had a drug problem. The first thing she did when they arrested her was she looked for typewriter fluid to, to sniff. And I said to myself, why do I want to prosecute this poor little, little kid? I'd like to get her treatment. I'd like to get her counseling. I'd like to get, find a way to heal her. And I was forced to prosecute her. It was a trial in front of a judge. It was open and shut. And after it was done, I felt terrible. And I went upstairs to where my colleagues were, and they all wanted to high five me for winning. And I was disgusted. And I knew then and there, I'm not going to last too long in this, this office, you know. Okay. And you tried a few other things. You're a transactional lawyer, a civil trial lawyer, but ultimately you became a criminal defense lawyer. I try, as I said before, a law degree can give you an opportunity to try many things. Now, a lot of lawyers don't have the, the gumption or the courage to try different things. They get on a treadmill and they never get off it. But I was always willing to try new things if I thought what I was doing was not where I wanted to spend my whole life. So I was a civil litigator. I was a prosecutor. I was assistant the president of a Getty Oil Company subsidiary where I went around supervising law firms around the country. Then I was with a small civil firm, and I began doing criminal work on my own, bringing criminal clients in. The firm was very flexible. They let me do it. And I realized one day, this is where I belong. I like the criminal courts. I like fighting for people's freedom. I like fighting against odds. I like the courtroom. 
and it just clicked and that I knew that was where I belonged. Okay. And so you get into criminal defense and in the beginning you start representing a lot of uh, gang members, Crips and Bloods in LA and so forth. I did. Yes. Okay. And how was that experience? Well, um, I began attending a African American church in South LA first, first AME church. Uh, I was drawn to Pastor Cecil Murray, a legendary pastor of the church. And I also began to defend a lot of gang members, Crips and Bloods, uh, who were charged usually with murder, sometimes lesser crimes, but usually homicide. And I said to myself one day, you know, the DA's office is just washing these kids right to prison for life. They're washing one after another through. This hardcore gang unit is so driven to arrest and convict and imprison young people that I don't think they're really paying attention to the details. And I think a lot of young people are being rushed to prison because of their race and their socioeconomic class. And I said to myself, how do you win these cases? Because there was such a spiral of gang violence throughout Los Angeles. This is the, this is the you know, the 90s. And Young men were just being gunned down every night in East LA and South LA, you name it. And there was such a dislike for gang violence. Uh, it was a problem that they would just basically, if they saw a young kid associated with a gang or wearing blue or wearing red or having a tattoo or a moniker, they would be inclined to arrest them. And what I discovered was that when young alleged gang members, they weren't all gang members, some of them were just showing off and, you know, you had to learn about the gang culture. Um, when they basically put them in front of a jury, primarily of people who were not from South LA or not from East LA, people who were afraid of those neighborhoods, and the prosecutor said, this is a vicious killer, they would convict them in a heartbeat. And they would put on police officers who were called gang experts to tell the jury how many gangs there were and how many homicides there were and how many burglaries there were and how you get jumped into a gang. And all of this was designed, in my opinion, to make sure an alleged gang member didn't get a fair trial. In fact, the LADA's office is the largest district attorney's office in the country. There are over a thousand DAs. And they have different units. You have special crimes, you have domestic violence, you have the gang unit, the hardcore gang unit, they call it. All of the units in the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office would never bring a case on the basis of one eyewitness identification unless there was some evidence to corroborate it, except the hardcore gang unit. If one person identified someone, even under terribly unreliable conditions, they didn't care if any evidence supported it. They would bring those, case, bring those cases, convict the person, and wash them away to prison for a life sentence. And I was very appalled by the indiscriminate, wholesale way young people were just marched off to prison. All right. You said, I became more effective because I cared. I was able to humanize these kids. Well, I hadn't grown up in the hood. I hadn't grown up in South LA. I hadn't grown up in East LA. Most of my cases came from South LA. And so I made a point to try and learn about my client. I would visit their home. I would talk to their parents. I would talk to their siblings. I would talk to classmates. I would talk to fellow gang members. I wanted to find out who they were as a human being, how they were raised, what obstacles they faced. And I also wanted to find out what good things they'd done. And it just occurred to me that someone from West LA or Pasadena, you know, um, parts, where, where parts of LA where you didn't have necessarily the gang problem you had in South LA, they didn't have a clue to these neighborhoods because there's a culture in Los Angeles of not visiting other neighborhoods. We're the most spread out city in the, in the country, and we have a culture of not visiting other neighborhoods. In New York or Chicago, people rub shoulders in the subway. They rub shoulders on the street. They rub shoulders in, in, in the crosstown bus. But L.A. is different. And I just realized how, what profound ignorance existed between neighborhoods. And if you don't understand a human being, if you don't relate to a human being, if you don't care about a human being, it's so much easier to just feel that you're safer if you convict when the prosecutor says convict. And I would see young white prosecutors, well-educated, blessed in life, 
referring to every young black kid as a gang member, as a gang banger. They love that term. It offended me. So I would basically try to explain as best I could in a courtroom what happens in these neighborhoods, how people with tattoos aren't necessarily gang members, people with monikers aren't necessarily gang members, how kids come out of their homes and to get to school they have to deal with gang members, and that actually it's pretty hard to get jumped into a gang. And people will show off and try and do things that don't necessarily mean they're vicious gang members at all. And I would try to humanize. I would put on character witnesses to explain what good people had done, put on family members, try and humanize them every way I could. And I began to have a lot more success defending these cases than the other lawyers I was watching just lose one trial after another. When defending somebody, so let's just say you're defending someone for murder. Does it matter to you if the person did it or not? First of all, people ask me that question all the time. And my answer is, I believe in criminal defense. I believe our criminal justice system is very imperfect, very flawed. Innocent people are convicted all the time, but I still think it's the best system I've seen. I've looked at other countries' systems. I've seen just judges who are political appointees deciding guilt or innocence. And our jury system is the fairest in the world, despite its problems. I mean, look, hundreds of people have been released from death row, from life sentences because of DNA. Think of years ago when there was no DNA to look at. Think of many innocent people and their families were destroyed through our justice system. But nevertheless, I do think it's the fairest I've seen as I look around the world. Um, everyone has to do their part to make the system fair. The judge has to do his or her part. The prosecutor has to do his or her part. The defense attorney has to do his or her part. And every time a defense attorney fights hard and professionally for their client, they make the system work. You can defend someone who's guilty of something. It may not be that they're guilty of what they were charged with, or they may not be guilty at all, or they may look guilty to you. But if you make sure the police don't abuse their power, if you make sure the prosecutor doesn't abuse his or her power, you are making everyone else safer and everyone else fair, and everyone is presumed innocent till proven guilty, no matter what the situation looks like. So I really believe in what criminal defense lawyers do. And I think we've done more to advance civil liberties and civil rights in the history of America than any other profession I can think of. I mean, were there certain cases where it was just so gruesome that you said, I'm not going to represent this person from a, a moralistic point of view, or will you defend anybody? I will defend people I suspect are guilty. I will defend people I suspect did something wrong because everyone deserves a chance. Everyone's, everyone deserves a competent, aggressive, passionate defense. If I feel emotionally, for some reason, I can't defend someone, I will, with, will not take the case. But let me say this. If I were ever faced with a situation where there was nobody left to defend that person except me, I would do it to make the system work. But I haven't been in that situation because there are plenty of other lawyers around mm -hmm. who will take cases. But I think every time a criminal lawyer steps in a courtroom and does a great job, they make us all more safe and more fair. Well, you said, I would like to abolish the death penalty. It is applied in a very unjust, arbitrary fashion in America. Mistakes are made and innocent people are executed. To me, the death penalty is nothing more than legislated revenge. I don't believe in the death penalty. I understand the vengeful feelings victims or their families have towards those who are convicted or, or suspected of murdering someone. I understand the feelings of vengeance, the feeling of, of wanting someone to pay for what happened, but I don't think we can afford to make a mistake with one person. And I do think mistakes are made. And I think DNA has proven that mistakes are made all the time. I mean, hundreds of people have been released. Those people could have been executed if they were convicted of, of a death penalty offense. So because it's so arbitrarily imposed, because our conditions are so imperfect, because we can't afford to make one mistake, and because I don't think the state should be in the business of legislating how to commit revenge, uh, I think we're better off just having the ultimate penalty, life in prison, which some people think is even worse. Mm. Well, 1995 rolls around, and then we have the OJ trial. Now, you and Johnny Cochran know each other. Yes. Johnny Cochran, to me, was the greatest trial lawyer I ever saw. Mm. I studied everything he did in the Simpson case. 
I'm very indebted to him. I want to want you to know that he recommended me to Michael Jackson as right. his defender. Uh, I was very flattered. He told Michael Jackson and his brother Randy Jackson that if you were ever in trouble, he'd want to hire me. And I'll never forget his doing that for me. I was not his. I, I knew him. I was not one of his closest friends. Um, but for him to recommend me that way, I'll never forget. But just watching what a talented, brilliant, personable, strategic, bright, careful trial lawyer this man was, was breathtaking. I think his closing argument in the O.J. Simpson case is the best closing argument I've ever seen. If it don't fit, you must convict. That was part of it. No, you must, you sorry, must sorry. acquit. <laughs> he must said, acquit. if you don't, if it don't fit, you must acquit. Yes, that was part of it. But I mean, <laughs> There's a lot there was more, such yeah. a range of emotion, range of passion. He would keep people watching him for days. You would be riveted to your seat for hour after hour after hour. And I remember during that closing argument, Court TV, who was televising the trial, switched back to a panel of lawyers in New York City to comment on it. And there was a district attorney from Brooklyn who basically said, I've been teaching how to, how to conduct a trial at law schools for 30 years. And I've always said, don't make your closing argument too long. You may turn off the jury. You may bore them. But he said, after what I just saw, I've got to reconsider everything I've been teaching. This is magnificent, what I just watched. So I feel like the OJ trial was sort of a turning point in, in American history because you had a black man accused of murdering a white woman and a white man. And from the outside looking in, everyone felt he was guilty, but he got acquitted. Yes. Did you feel like OJ was innocent or guilty from your point of view? From my point of view, not being on the defense team, not knowing OJ, not having access to what the defense had access to, he looked very guilty. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had his blood at the crime scene. You had victim's blood in his, in his van. You had blood at his home. Uh, apparently his alibi that he was in Chicago didn't hold up completely. Uh, you had a lot to suggest that he did this. But what the defense did, the way they attacked, the way evidence was collected, the way it was transported, the way it was processed, the way it was stored, the way it was contaminated was just brilliant. It was a combination of Johnny Cochran, Barry Sheck, and Peter Neufeld were the preeminent DNA lawyers in America. Uh, Robert Shapiro, you had a F. Lee Bailey, you had a group of very talented lawyers who were able to combine their talents and get an acquittal in a case that looked overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, years later, when he got convicted of trying to take his memorabilia back, and they gave him a sentence that almost seemed like it was revenge for him getting off earlier. Do you think that's what happened, or do you think that ultimately the sentencing was fair? I think the sentencing was not fair. I think it was basically OJ and a bunch of his friends trying to get back what was rightfully his. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one or two, as I recall, I don't remember exactly, had a gun. Yeah, I don't think anyone was really in jeopardy from what I heard. And it looked like a stupid thing to do in a hotel room in a casino, but it didn't merit nine years in prison, not at all. This right. was payback. It was payback. Well, at one point, I guess Charles Manson wanted you to represent him? I did visit with Charles Manson in the mid-90s okay. uh, at Corcoran State Prison. Had about three hours with him. Fascinating time. Uh, I was contacted by some people who knew Charles Manson to ask if I was interested. I was not interested in getting involved in representing him at that point. The issues were primarily civil issues, um, and I did not uh, get involved in that, that situation. So were you meeting and talking to him? Yes. What was Charles Manson like in person? Very interesting. Um, <laughs> okay. He uh, he was had a very intense stare. He clearly was a bright person. Uh, I thought he was a little bit manipulative. You know, he would sort of be testing me to see what kind of a person I was and what could influence me and what would not influence me. Uh, he was sitting with one of his friends, a non-lawyer, uh, to assist him. And but very studying me very intently, but talking a lot, trying to get my reactions to what he said. And I had read Helter Skelter by the prosecutor Bliosi, so I knew a lot something about the facts in the case. And and he was he would revert back to some of discussion about some of the things in that book, um, which I'd read about. I, I sensed maybe he lived in the past a little bit, 
but he was he was clever and perceptive and clearly very bright. Okay, so then in two thousand one, you represented Mike Tyson. I, I I received a phone call from a lawyer friend in Arizona who was Mike Tyson's lawyer, and he said to me, "They're thinking of charging Mike Tyson with rape in San Bernardino County, and a woman has come forward claiming she was raped." Gloria Allred, the famous attorney in Los Angeles, has already agreed to represent her. Mm. They've already given a press conference. Would you be California counsel on the defense team? And I said I would. And we put together a booklet which had a number of investigative materials that we quickly got together to convince the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office that Mike had not raped anybody or assaulted anybody. And that included information on the alleged victim. And we presented this booklet to the DA's office, and they agreed not to prosecute. Right, because this comes off the heels of Tyson's conviction for rape in 1992. He had already been, yes, he had already been to prison. He had already been convicted, uh, which I must say, the more I look at what happened in that courtroom, the more suspicious it looks. I mean, I think you probably know that uh, he was convicted after the defense presented evidence that a young woman had gone up to his hotel room at two in the morning. And apparently they'd been making out in a limousine, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I question whether he should have been convicted at all in that case, but he was convicted. He went to prison, he came out. And now another woman was trying to claim that he committed a sexual assault. And we were able to convince the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office that there was no case at all. Now, was this your first celebrity client? Well, I'd represented some people in the entertainment business uh, in the 90s before that. Um, I'd been consulted by some well-known people. I won't mention who they are when they had problems, but he was probably the highest profile person I had agreed to defend at that point. Yes. So were you and Mike Tyson communicating during this time? I was communicating through his team in Arizona. Got it. Got it. And, I mean, you got his case dropped. They didn't charge him. Yeah. And, you would, you know, given the fact that he was a target, that he'd already been convicted, which could make a subsequent conviction easier for a prosecutor, uh, I think we did a very good job in convincing them there was no case. So you said that many celebrities have an unrealistic view of the courtroom because they've seen trials on television and film. So they think they're experts. Uh, a lot of times what they consider a true performance is often a trial disaster waiting to happen. Well, here's one problem defending celebrities. The the courtroom is a very strange, counterintuitive place. Things happen in courtrooms that don't happen outside of courtrooms. A courtroom, first of all, is a very sterile, very threatening place. You don't see children playing in a courtroom. You don't see uh, a lot of fun things. It's very, very solemn, very serious. Uh, very cold. And what happens in a courtroom is not really reality. It's a reconstruction of reality. You know, we need a justice system. We have to do something uh, to make sure there's justice in society. So we have certain rules and procedures. The lawyers have to follow those rules and procedures. And reality that happens somewhere else at some other time is reconstructed in the courtroom. And A lot of trials are sensationalized on television. You have TV shows, you have movies, you have books, you have all sorts of not so realistic ways of portraying a courtroom. So people in the entertainment business very often think they know what happens in the courtroom because of the shows they've seen, the movies they've seen, the novels they've read. And it may have very little to do with what really happens. Let me give you an example. Jermaine Jackson, Michael's brother, wrote a book about Michael. And Jermaine Jackson, who came to his criminal trial periodically, was there a lot, uh, he writes in the beginning of his book that we weren't sure what was going on because every night during that five-month trial, we would look at the news and they would say the prosecution is winning. And then we would talk to his lead lawyer, Tom Mesereau, who would say, we're doing fine. And we weren't quite sure how to process this. Well, 
They were looking at sound bites on TV. You have a jury looking at eight hours of evidence throughout a day, morning, noon, and, and into the evening. And then you have an entertainment program summarizing what happened in a few sound bites. So there's no way those few sound bites are going to accurately portray what's going on in a courtroom or what's important in a courtroom. So I was basically, although you can never know what a jury is thinking or what they're going to do, I was pretty optimistic. We were doing a very excellent job. And as Jermaine said, we turn on the TV and they'd say it's a disaster for the defense, another mm -hmm. disaster today for the defense. Right. Well, what happened was a number of the reporters would look at a prosecution witness. The prosecutor would put that witness on. The witness would say something that appeared damaging to the defense. The reporter would run out of the courtroom and report it. They wouldn't look at the cross-examination when we obliterated that witness with all sorts of provable lies, provable contradictions. So how the media chooses to portray a courtroom or a trial is very often has nothing to do with what's really going on. They're just reconstructing what they think is important, reconstructing what they think is, is dramatic, will help their ratings, will help generate controversy, and you can't necessarily trust them. Right. I think a lot of, uh, I think you mentioned this as well, that a lot of celebrities feel that if they win in the court of public opinion, they'll somehow win in the trial itself, which a lot of times is just not true at all, which is why you see a lot of people who have open cases doing interviews and putting information out there, which ends up being used against them. Well, you want to focus on what's going to happen in the courtroom because that's the most important place. The most important people are 13 people, a judge and 12 jurors. They are the most important. And yes, do you want good information outside in the atmosphere, on the media, on the airwaves? Of course you do. Would you like people saying good things about you? Of course. Could that affect a jury pool? Yes, it could. But let me say this. I think jurors, jurors in America really follow their oath. And a judge will put a jury under oath in a courtroom. He will tell them to follow his or her instructions. They are not to follow any media reporting on the trial, on the case. And he will tell them to avoid newspapers. And he will tell them only to focus on what's in the courtroom. And I think jurors do their best to follow the judge's instructions. I think American juries tend to be very independent and don't want to be manipulated, don't want to be, uh, you know, basically abused by media coverage. Let me mention the Michael Jackson jury, for example. We had about a five-month trial. I thought we did a very good job. During the eight days of jury deliberation, all the major networks were showing a jail cell where they claimed he was going to be. And they were talking about how he would spend his time in jail when he was convicted. They were talking about what time he would get up, what he would wear, what he could eat, would he have reading material, would, would visitors be allowed to see him, could he pray. I mean, this was going on every day, and in my opinion, this was a blatant attempt to influence the jury, mm. and it didn't work. Well, uh, before that case, you represented Robert Blake, the law, the uh, the actor. Yes. Uh, for over the murder of his wife, uh, Bonnie Lee Bakley. Yes. So, explain the case and explain how you won this case. Well, Robert Blake was charged with murder with special circumstances, which means you could face the death penalty if they choose. If, you have, if you're charged with murder with special circumstances, the prosecution can either seek the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole. And he'd been represented by another lawyer, a good friend of mine, very good lawyer, Harlan Braun. Uh, Robert was looking for a new lawyer. I was donating my time at a free legal clinic at First African Methodist Episcopal Church in South LA. And one of the other volunteer lawyers did transactional work for Robert Blake. And he said to me one day, Mr. Blake would like to meet you. He's looking for a new attorney. Would you be willing to meet with him? And I said I would. I met with him, had a couple of discussions, and to make a long story short, was chosen as his lead counsel. And at, at that point in time, this was the most extensive investigation into any case by the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. The LAPD had exceeded, in terms of paperwork and time, the investigation into O.J. Simpson. They'd gone all around the country trying to find out everything they could about Robert Blake, about his films, about who he associated with, 
et cetera. And it was a very intensely investigated case. They, you know, they charged O.J. Simpson right away with homicide. But in the Robert Blake case, they waited about a year before they arrested him. And then they immediately tried to prejudice the potential jury pool against him. The police chief announced that he had solved the crime, that kind of thing. And I dug into the, uh, the evidence and I began to see all sorts of problems. I mean, they had jumped to conclusions uh, without proper investigation, investigation at all. And I felt the LAPD became enamored with publicity, enamored with the possibility of this being a high profile case. In fact, at the crime scene, they invited a writer to come down as one of the first people they said, come on down and see what's going on. And they were letting this writer do ride-alongs with them. And they really misjudged a lot of what had happened. Robert Blake had nothing to do with this. Um, they were enamored with winning a big case, particularly after they'd lost Simpson. And he got a raw deal, in my opinion. Okay, he was ultimately acquitted. Yes. Um, he ended up filing for bankruptcy because I guess there was like $3 million in unpaid legal fees, ultimately. Was that part, no, of, part no. of the money that you were owed? Or? No, what happened was there was a civil trial. He was ah. acquitted in the criminal trial. Oh, but he lost a civil trial. And then there was a civil trial where they sued him for wrongful death mm -hmm. to determine that he was liable or responsible for the death. Like the OJ case. And I didn't represent him in the civil trial. He was found liable in that trial. Got it a ridiculously high judgment was awarded against him. It was eventually cut in half by a higher court. And I, I did not represent him in a bankruptcy proceeding. I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. Got it. So then in 2005, the Michael Jackson case. Well, before this case, Michael Jackson was accused of child sexual abuse in 1993. Um, he ended up settling with the family out of court, right? Yes. And the prosecutors ended up dropping the criminal investigation after the accuser stopped cooperating. Did you and Michael talk about that case? Michael Jackson told me in no uncertain terms that settling that case in 1994 was the biggest mistake he'd ever made. He should never have settled it. He should have fought it through a trial. He would have won. It was an absurd case. But he was advised, he told me, by lawyers, by business advisors, to settle it and get rid of it, that he had bigger fish to fry, bigger projects to, to get involved in, that the money would be a drop in the bucket compared to what he was capable of making around the world, and that diverting everybody's attention because of the publicity attached to this civil case was a mistake. Uh, he followed his advisor's you know, suggestions, he paid money, and what it really did was it opened Pandora's box because suddenly everybody on the planet began suing him, thinking they could make an easy buck suing Michael Jackson. I mean, employees were suing him. Uh, people he met on the street were suing him. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he told me that was the biggest mistake he ever made was not fighting that till the end. How much did he settle for in that case? Well, allegedly it was around $20 million. Wow. There, there are differing opinions as to how much it was. I was not involved in that case and yeah. I was not involved in that settlement. I had to deal with it because to my shock, the trial judge in the criminal case that I defended allowed evidence that he had settled cases to come into the trial. I had never seen that before. I thought it was highly prejudicial, but the judge let it in. So I had to deal with the fact that the jury knew he had settled two other cases uh, the judge didn't let the dollar amounts come into the courtroom, but people knew what they were. Um, I had to deal with that. And basically, as I said a second ago, I told the jury that he was advised to do this, that he would make far more money than this. He was the, great, the world's greatest singer, choreographer, the greatest artist, the greatest dancer, that he should get rid of this case, that the money was a drop in the bucket. And he unfortunately followed that advice. Uh, okay. So then there was a documentary that came out in 2003 called Living with Michael Jackson. And in that documentary, they showed him holding hands with a, a young boy named Gavin Arvizo. And he also talked about how he would have kids sleeping, you know, in this large bed of his. And that actually triggered his 2005 case. 
That's correct. There was a documentary uh, that was made by someone named Martin Bashir. And unfortunately, he convinced Michael that he would be a very fair documentary filmmaker that, according to Michael, because I wasn't involved in this, uh, Michael said the man told him that he would make him, uh, he would treat him very fairly. Uh, he would show what a wonderful artist and father he was. And Michael was expecting this documentary to be very positive. It turned out, turned out to be exactly the opposite. But Michael did something very smart. He wouldn't conduct any interview with this producer without having his own videographer present. So we had the parts that were included in the documentary, and we had the outtakes that were not included in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And there was a tremendous difference between what this producer portrayed Michael as in the documentary and what he was saying to him in the outtakes he did not include. So what happened in the trial was the prosecutors wanted permission from the court, the judge, to use this documentary and show it to the jury. And I, I acted like I didn't want them to. I actually did. Because, first of all, a lot, a lot of that documentary I thought would be very appealing to a jury. You show a very young Michael Jackson performing as a child. You show him grow and develop. You show his enormous talent. He sings. You know, the, the music just takes over, you know, the atmosphere. So the press fixated on a couple of quotes they thought were very damaging to Michael Jackson. I focused on the other parts, which I thought were very favorable to him, and I wanted the judge to let us use the outtakes that weren't included, where the producer, Mr. Bashir, told him he was a great father, he was learning wonderful things from him. I mean, the outtakes were very different from the spirit of the documentary, as far as I'm concerned. So both came in, the documentary came in, the prosecution's case, the outtakes came in our case, and the rest is history. He was acquitted of every count. Well, I think that the thing that really bothered a lot of people was the whole sleeping in the same bed as Michael. And even though I think most people understand this is not like a twin-size bed, you know, this is probably some gigantic bed. It was bigger than the building we're in. <laughs> you know, when you talk about Michael Jackson's bedroom, you're talking about a building that's bigger than where we are filming today. Mm. I mean, this was a huge, huge area, and parents would stay on the bed, sisters would stay on the bed, brothers would stay on the bed. It wasn't at all what the prosecution was trying to spin it as being. And, you know, unfortunately, Michael was well-meaning. There was nothing sexual about any of this. Uh, he was nice to everybody. I had parents testify that they had slept in his room. <laughs> I mean... It wasn't at all what the prosecution was portraying it as, as being. And that's the thing about a courtroom. It's a reconstruction of reality. The prosecution tries to make reality look this way. The defense tries to make reality look this way. And the jury decides who's correct. Well, at one point, he was actually charged for the abuse. And the police ended up um, raiding Neverland Ranch, where they, they took everything they could possibly take. Well, and like you said earlier, Johnny Cochran actually told Michael to use you as a lawyer. Well, Johnny Cochran and Howard Weitzman had represented Michael in the early 1990s in the case that settled in 1994. Uh -huh. I was not involved in that case. Yeah. When he was charged in 2003, um, Randy and his brother and Michael talked to Johnny Cochran, who recommended me. Now, at first, I wouldn't take the case because I was tied up with Robert Blake. Uh, and I was, I'll never forget the, the day Neverland was raided um, by 70 sheriffs and their assistants. Uh, I, I kept getting phone calls from Las Vegas, where Michael Jackson was staying asking if I would immediately jump on a plane and come to Las Vegas. And I said, I can't do it because I'm tied up with the Robert Blake case, which is going to trial in February. I'm feverishly getting ready to try this case. And they just were amazed that anybody would say, I can't do this. <laughs> right. But I couldn't do both. And eventually, my, Robert Blake and I had a falling out, and I withdrew from the case during jury selection. And as soon as I did that, Randy Jackson called me and said, are you available now? We've always wanted you. And I said, well, 
that's very flattering. Um, why don't I meet your brother and we'll see where it goes. So I was secretly flown to Orlando, Florida. Uh, I was put in a limousine and taken to a home and interviewed by Michael Jackson and his people. And that was the first time I'd ever met him. Now he hardly said a word during that meeting. He stayed in the back. He stared at me very intently. And his people were asking me questions about who I was and my background and the cases I'd done, et cetera. Uh, I left the next day wondering if I'd ever hear from him again. And shortly after that, Randy Jackson called me and said, my brother said, you're the one. So one thing led to another and I was retained. Okay. So you have this initial meeting and then you become Michael Jackson's official lawyer. At that point, do you guys start to talk more and have more conversations and start to really dig into this whole situation? Well, yes. I would go to Neverland. We would have meetings. We would talk about various aspects of evidence. When I start a case, my attitude is I don't believe anybody. I don't believe the prosecution. I don't believe the defense. I don't trust anything. I want to see for myself what's going on. So I realized what these allegations were. I realized that he'd been accused of this before. And I met with him, I believe, with a very open mind to try and figure out who Michael Jackson was and what kind of a case this was. And it didn't take me very long to conclude he would never harm a child. He would never molest a child. This made no sense that he was just a target of opportunism of various forms. Prosecutors wanted to be stars. People wanted to sue him. If he were convicted, he would be disabled. Anybody and their mother's uncle could file a lawsuit. How would he defend himself in prison? I mean, I realized what a phenomenal target he was. He was the most famous person on the planet. He was one of the wealthiest people on the planet. He owned the catalog, which included Beatles music and other great artists. I mean, he was such a target. And he was also perceived as not someone who would want to fight a case. He was received as very gentle, very childlike, very creative, someone who danced to their own drummer. And he was just such a phenomenal target. I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever see a bigger target for opportunists than Michael Jackson. Okay, so the trial starts to begin and the jury selection starts. And for a trial this big, there's a lot of pressure to pick the right jurors. And I guess you were told to stay away from women jurors. I was. But you went the opposite way. Well, I had a consultant with a lot, who had a lot of experience, <clears throat> a lot of insight, did a very, very professional profile on what a good defense juror would be, what a good prosecution juror would be, and how different categories like income, occupation, race, religion, political affiliation, they, she would correlate all these factors with what she thought a theoretically ideal prosecution juror would be and what a theoretically ideal defense juror would be. And I was advised to be very careful with women, stay away from women, particularly mothers. The charges are very disturbing uh, to anyone who parents, children, this is going to be a horrible thing to explain. And I looked at the, the consultant and said, I'm following my instincts. I'd like women. Right. You said um, you actually chose as many women as possible. We had charity. a majority of women. Right. We did. We were, we, uh, well, we disqualified a few, mm -hmm. but we had a majority of women on the jury, which is what I wanted. Right. You said, I had to consider who'd be most receptive to my efforts at humanizing Michael Jackson. The yeah. prosecutors were trying to viciously attack his sexuality. They yeah. alternated between claims that he was gay and asexual. Yes. The prosecution, directly and indirectly, overtly and subtly, were trying to attack Michael Jackson's sexuality. Mm -hmm. They were calling him a pedophile. They were calling him asexual sometimes. They were suggesting he was gay. Mm -hmm. They were doing anything they could to try and alienate him from the jury in that location, in that part of Santa Barbara County, which tends to be very conservative. And it was nasty and degrading and malicious what they were doing, but I knew what they were doing. Somebody had told these prosecutors, whenever you can, use the phrase sleeping with little boys, sleeping with little boys, sleeping with little boys. 
anything to dehumanize Michael Jackson. I wanted women for a number of reasons. First of all, I thought men in general would be far more judgmental of Michael Jackson than women. I generally have found women to be much more emotionally flexible and available, particularly when a male's sexuality is being attacked. They don't get judgmental the way men can. Heterosexual men can be rather insecure about their sexuality. Hmm. When you attack Michael Jackson that way, you're trying to just generate prejudice against him and you're being invited to give yourself a sense of security by judging him harshly. In cases where I had defended gay men, I always found heterosexual women to be much more receptive to the truth and much less harshly judgmental right off the bat than heterosexual men. Obviously, gay women or gay men were fine. But, you know, defense attorneys have to face reality. You've got a life on the line. You've got to follow your instincts. Even if these are generalities that don't always apply, and even if these generalities sound somewhat demeaning or offensive elsewhere, you've got to follow your experience. You've got to follow your intuition. You've got to follow your instincts. And I ended up with a jury that I felt would be open-minded to the truth and not judge him because he was a different kind of person. Right, because I remember that was always the question in my mind of, well, is Michael Jackson gay or straight? Now, that doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that he's into children, but he's being accused of molesting boys. So so the gay part was always a question in my mind. And I remember at one point I went through the paperwork um, from the, the, the sheriff's uh, office of all the stuff that they found in Neverland Ranch. And it was actually a large pornography collection <laughs> of like straight porn, like, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff I would watch. Uh, and at that point I said, okay, that's all nonsense. Michael Jackson seemed like he was a straight man. Well, when they raided Neverland, and again, it was 70 plus sheriffs raided Neverland. They found hordes of Playboy, Penthouse, and what I call girly magazines. Right. And they didn't know how to explain this because they knew this could help the defense right. in explaining he's not a pedophile. He's not someone who's enraptured with young males. Mm -hmm. He's a heterosexual male who likes to look at beautiful women who are naked. Mm -hmm. And they came up with a way for them to explain it they thought would help them. They said, your typical pedophile grooms their victim by showing sexually explicit material. So they tried to say that all of these magazines, which were everywhere, hmm. and what he had had is his people going out and buying for him. They tried to say all of this was part of what a pedophile does to groom a victim. That was their explanation. I don't think it flew at all. Right. Well, I guess there were no black people on the jury. There was one black alternate uh -huh. who never made it to the actual jury. But there was just, this was a community with very few African Americans, uh, a large Latino population, very few Asians. This was Northern Santa Barbara County, largely blue collar. A lot of people lived there who couldn't afford to live in South County because it's so expensive. Montecito, the city of Santa Barbara. And this courthouse had a very high conviction rate. They usually went with the prosecution. They were very law and order people. But what I did before the trial, one of the smartest things I did was I started hanging around local bars and restaurants. I would drive up in my jeans and just go into a bar and just sit there alone, have a couple of glasses of wine. And very often somebody would start talking to me because they figured out that I was the lawyer representing Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I would have a nice, friendly discussion. And at some point I would say, what do you think of Michael Jackson? And I really got the impression, two things really stood out. One, was it a conservative place? Yes. Were they pro-law and order? Yes. Were they pro-prosecution? Yes. But they were also very libertarian. They felt they were good, law-abiding people and didn't want government to go too far intruding into their life. So that was something that was very important. The other thing was, most of them thought Michael Jackson had been a good neighbor. They were very proud to have him in their community. And the few times they ever saw him, if they did, he seemed like the nicest guy in the world, generous, kind. 
And coincidentally, I had a doctor who had a second home near Neverland. And I would ask him, what do the neighbors think of Michael Jackson? He said, we're all pulling for him. We, mm. we think this is BS. Mm. We're all on his side. So my impression was you had very independent-minded people, very strong-willed people, very fair people. And we started off with a good impression of Michael Jackson. And a lot of them didn't care for the southern part of Santa Barbara County. And that's where the DA had his main office. So I said to myself, you know, I want Michael Jackson to stay in his community because people talked about trying to move for a change of venue to another courthouse. I said, no, I got a good feeling about this courthouse. I got a good feeling about this community. I think they'll be very fair. And let's just stay right here. Even though the media was saying we're crazy to want to stay there, you can't get an acquittal there. I felt we could. Well, uh, in terms of having uh, no black people on the 12 person jury, uh, you said that my trial approach was that Michael Jackson brought all races together. He was a scion of a prominent black family with two white and one Latino child. Yes. Michael Jackson made a statement one time that he would like to adopt a child from every continent. And look at his music. Look at his lyrics. You know, he tried to bring races together. He didn't try to divide people. Now, when I first got in the case... He was, being, he was showing up in court surrounded by the Nation of Islam and surrounded by black activists. And I went to his brother, Randy, and I said, Randy, stop this. This is dividing him from the community that's going to judge his fate. I got one intention, not to make a social statement, not to make a political statement. I want to win this case. I want to secure his freedom. So stop the Nation of Islam guards. Stop having black activists showing up in Santa Maria, California. Let me show that he embraces his community. He brings races together. Look at his song. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. And look at his children. And this is somebody that, the, that heals the world, doesn't divide it. Well, when you said two white and one Latino child, there's always been the question of whether these are his biological children or not. Did you guys ever have conversations about that? No, I never asked him that. I assumed they were his children. He loved them more than anybody could love. I mean, he was such a devoted father. You could tell how much he loved his kids. He spent a lot of time with his kids. He had a huge book collection to make sure they read books. He was so driven to be a good father. Um, I never would ask him if these were his natural kids or not. I didn't mean didn't make any difference to me. Right. Okay. So then the trial starts. And you actually brought some people to get on the stand on his defense, one of which was Chris Tucker. That's correct. What did Chris Tucker really bring to this trial? Chris Tucker was my last witness in our case. First of all, I had to think long and hard about whether we needed to put on a defense case because I thought the cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses was devastating to the prosecution. But then I said to myself, these charges are so ugly, so awful. I mean, I think being charged with molesting a child is worse than being charged with homicide. I mean, the charges were so bad, I said to myself, we can't just cross-examine their witnesses. We have to tell our story. And if you're going to put on a defense case and subject your witnesses to cross-examination, just like the prosecution witnesses are subject to cross-examination, you want to start strong, you want to end strong, you put the less strong witnesses in the middle. That's sort of a psychological tactic that defense lawyers use. And I ended with Chris Tucker, who knew the family of accusers. He had hung out with the family of accusers. He had actually taken them to some Oakland Raiders games. He had invited them to the rehearsal set in Las Vegas for rush hour. And he knew them very well, and he expressed his opinions about them to the jury. Well, I remember I, I interviewed Eddie Griffin, who I guess was friends with Michael. He actually, you know, drove Michael to, to the courthouse and everything else like that. And he always maintained that, that Michael was innocent. But he also said that Michael was really stressed out during that time. Poor Michael was not built for a situation like this. You have to understand what the charges are. First of all, <clears throat> understand that Michael was one of the most sensitive, one of the most generous, one of the kindest people I've ever met. He contributed widely to various causes. He had a rule that whenever he gave a concert, he would visit a children's hospital to visit the kids, to try and inspire them to overcome their illness and to think positively. He was a very kind, nice, 
person. He was an exquisitely sensitive person. I mean, he was just an artist like you can't, he never took a dance lesson. Hmm. He would create the most amazing choreography, the most amazing performance. I mean, nobody would see anything like this. And he was very, very sensitive. What was he facing in the courtroom? First of all, the prosecution claimed he had masterminded a criminal conspiracy. He was the mastermind, they said, to abduct children, to falsely imprison a family, and to commit criminal extortion. Now, they tried to make him look like a big mobster type, which is utterly ridiculous. Michael Jackson would no more know how to even think about extorting someone, falsely imprisoning a family. It's utterly ridiculous, but they charged him with that. They also charged him with attempted child molestation. They charged him with child molestation, and they claimed in the last three counts of the indictment that he had taken a cancer-stricken child and plied that child with alcohol which he knew would hurt the child's health in order to prepare that child to be molested. These were the most malicious charges, if you think about it. And for Michael to sit in a courtroom day in and day out and watch the prosecution to try portray him as some monster, some mobster type, was utterly debilitating. And he did lose weight. He did, his cheeks, that last day of, of court, the verdict day, his cheeks were just sunken in. The poor fellow just looked emaciated. He looked pale as a ghost. He looked just debilitated. I mean, I think he was frozen with fear. And because, look, he went home after trial each day. He was out on bond, out on bail. And he would turn on the TV like everybody else. And all he'd see was, bad day for the defense, bad day for the defense. Bad day for Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson's in trouble. Michael Jackson's going to be convicted. And this war on him, because it went on for about five months. We started in January of 2005. We ended June 13th, 2005. That's a long trial, five days a week. There were a few breaks in between, but it was a devastatingly harsh experience for Michael Jackson. Well, uh, Macaulay Culkin took the stand for the defense. He was our second witness. Right. And Fabulous witness for Michael Jackson. Right. I remember they did the, he was in the black or white video at one point. I guess the two of them had a close relationship. They were very dear friends. Uh, I met with Macaulay the night before I called him as a witness. I met with he and his New York lawyer. He had an entertainment lawyer with him. And the lawyer was nervous as can be mm. and about what this might do to his career and what it might do to him. And he was very concerned about his client, which I understand completely. Macaulay, on the other hand, was so confident, so convinced he was doing the right thing, and so adamant that he was never molested, that he was never put in a compromising position by Michael Jackson, that Michael Jackson was his close friend, that they both came up as child stars, and they knew the rigors and the pressures of being a child star. And he said, this is my friend. I'm testifying for him. This, this stuff never happened. Remember, the prosecution called witnesses to say they'd saw Macaulay being molested at Neverland by Michael. Mm. Macaulay gets on the stand and says, he never molested me at any time. <laughs> We're dear friends. We yeah. share a lot. We have a lot in common. He would never do a thing like this. And by the way, let me say this also. I meet with Macaulay and his lawyer that evening. The next morning I get up. I'm getting dressed for court. I turn on the television, and here's the, one of the major networks, and their reporter is saying, we've learned that Macaulay Culkin is not going to show up to court today, that his agents, his producers, his directors, his lawyers are all telling him he has nothing to gain, and he has refused to testify. And here I was with him the night before, <laughs> knowing full well I'm calling him to the stand that day. That just tells you what happens when you look at the media and when you're dealing with reality as opposed to the media. Well, and the other witness that you called was Wade Robson. Yes. Who ultimately was one of the, the two people who did Leaving Neverland. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in this case, Wade Robson took the stand to say that Michael Jackson never did anything improper. Wade Robson was my first witness. Hmm. And as I said before, if you're putting on a defense case, you want to start strong, you want to end strong. We started with Wade Robson. We ended with Chris Tucker. Macaulay Culkin was our second witness. 
I met with Wade, I met with his mother, I met with his sister, I called all three of them as witnesses. And Wade was adamant to me that he was never touched, that he was never violated, that this was these allegations were nonsense. Because remember, they put on some witnesses to say Wade was molested, right. that, they, that they saw it. And he was such a strong witness for us, such a strong defender and supporter of Michael Jackson that I made, her our, made him our first witness. But I also called his mother and his sister, who had traveled with Wade and Michael on some of these tours, and they testified they never saw anything bad happen or anything wrong happen. And I mean, the three of them could not have been stronger advocates for Michael Jackson. So when I heard about this movie, Leaving Neverland, I was stunned, absolutely stunned, because he talked to me. He was adamant he was never touched. I called him as my witness. He testified under oath he was never touched. And then a very, very good prosecutor, Ron Zonin, terrific prosecutor and a vicious cross-examiner, went after him tooth and nail, and he never budged. Mm. He said, it's ridiculous. He never never did anything like this to me. Well, like you said. Words tri- to that effect. Yeah. Well, like you said, uh, the trial lasted uh, from January to June 2005. And at the end, Michael Jackson was acquitted on all 14 charges. 10 felonies and four misdemeanors. They didn't get him on anything. In fact, just so you know, he was indicted by a grand jury for 10 felony counts. At the end of the trial, as it was going to the jury, the judge said he's going to give the jury some options on the last four felony counts. If they acquit him of any of those last four felony counts, I'm going to give them the option of convicting of a misdemeanor. So they had to say guilty or not guilty 14 times, 10 felonies, four misdemeanor options. They said not guilty, all felonies, not guilty, all misdemeanors, not guilty, anything. Sitting next to Michael Jackson, what was his reaction when he heard that news? You know, he came in the courtroom that day. He looked, his cheeks were sunken in. He looked frozen with fear. He was, he just was weakened. You could just see it in his eyes, see it in his, his, the way he carried himself. I think he was terrified with fear. I think a lot of people had said to him, the media says you're going to be convicted. I happen to know some people told him he was going to be convicted. And they were trying to cheer him up that there'll be an appeal and all this. I never said that to him. We went into the courtroom. The, we sat down. The media was packed in the courtroom and outside the courtroom. In fact, this particular trial had over 2,200 accredited media, which is more accredited media than O.J. Simpson and Scott Peterson combined. Hmm. That's how big this trial was around the world. So the media is every place. They set up tents everywhere around the courthouse. Um, There was a buildup to the verdict you know, he was—he had an entourage, some limousines with security, et cetera. They were on their way to the courthouse. All the major airwaves had, they were following this caravan of limos to the courthouse. He stops in front of the courthouse. He comes out of the car with his entourage. I meet him there. We go into the courtroom. Courtroom fills up. The judge comes out, asks for silence. He then brings the jurors out. They fill the jury box. The foreman of the jury hands the verdict forms to the bailiff who hands the verdict forms to the judge who looks them over and then asks the jurors, you know, is this your verdict? And the foreman says yes. And then the court clerk at the judge's request reads the verdicts, one count after another. And uh, when the last not guilty came down, I said to Michael, you're free. And he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. We hugged. All the defense team hugged, and then we left the courthouse. Well, you said that the prosecution is a travesty of justice and one of the most mean-spirited attacks on an innocent person in legal history. That's how I feel about that case. Yeah. I think the way the prosecution constructed this case, the way they charged this case, the way they presented the case was an absolute travesty of justice. It was almost as if, psychologically, because they were going after someone who was innocent, they went overboard trying to demonize and monsterize the defendant. 
as I've said earlier, I mean, how do you possibly charge Michael Jackson like he's a mafia chieftain, masterminding a criminal conspiracy of various individuals to falsely imprison a family and abduct children? How do you even come up with that idea? <laughs> right. I think they did it because they felt we have to go overboard to have a chance of getting him. And fortunately, they fail. Can you say how much you were paid to defend him? No, I can't. That's uh, that's <laughs> private. <laughs> I'm sure it was quite a bit, though. Okay. Did you maintain a relationship with Michael after the case throughout you, the years? You know, after the verdict, I had lived in Santa Maria, in northern Santa Barbara County, for six months. I moved back to Los Angeles, my home. Uh, I communicated with Michael a little bit. But the main subject of my communication was I felt he should leave Neverland. Hmm. Uh, and that did not go over so well because he loved Neverland. He loved what he created. He had created the most idyllic, beautiful, magical, enchanting place to live. You kind of had to be there during the day and you had to be there at night. At night, he had strategically placed lights at various parts of Neverland. He had, he was playing Disney-like music. Um, it was such a beautiful place. The animals, the zoo, the amusement park. You, you, you have one of the greatest creative geniuses on the planet using his en enormous talents and creativity to create an environment to live in that he just felt so at home at. So I said, look, you got to leave here. I said, every place in life has a start and a finish. I said, I don't trust the prosecution. They've been humiliated before the whole world. You know, they thought there was no way they could lose this case. And they're going to be gunning for you. They're going to be looking for something to come after you on. Some child is going to wander through a fence and they're going to say the kid was molested. <laughs> they're going to come up yeah. with something. I said, I don't think you can live in peace here. And um, he had people calling me saying, what do you know? What do you, why did you conclude this? Because a lot of people didn't want him to leave, mm. you know? Uh, but I told them the truth. I said, I just don't trust the environment. They, they've been humiliated. They're devastated by this loss in front of the whole world. And then I didn't hear from him for about maybe three weeks, four weeks. And then he called my law firm partner from Bahrain in the Middle East, where he had moved to. And uh, then, of course, one thing after another, he moved the Middle East. He was there about 11 months, I think. Then he moved, I think, to Ireland. He tried, and he thought of living in England and um, eventually ended up back in Las Vegas, then moved to Los Angeles uh, to start his comeback tour, and then unfortunately passed away. Yeah, in 2009, he ended up dying. And you actually went to his funeral. I went, I went to his burial. Burial. The large funeral um, at Staples Center I was not able to go to because I was in the middle of a trial and a federal judge would not let me have the day off. Hmm. So unfortunately, I had to miss that. I really wanted to go. I did say some words which were in the program about what I felt about Michael, but the burial I did attend. Yeah, such a loss and such a shock uh, to the world. Um, I mean, when you found out the way he died, you know, he had a live-in doctor that was prescribing drugs to him that he should not have been prescribing. Uh, I mean, he was giving Michael Jackson a drug that they use when you operate on somebody and you want them completely unconscious. And Michael ended up essentially dying from that drug. Um, and the doctor ended up getting convicted. What were your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, anyone who's facing what Michael Jackson was facing during the criminal trial is probably going to want to have some medication. There, he was having trouble sleeping. He was having trouble with depression. He was having trouble with anxiety. So many people facing a criminal case will go to their physician and be prescribed anti-anxiety medication, antidepressant medication, sleep medication. That's not unusual at all. I never asked him if he was on any medication, but I assumed he was on some like many other people. I never heard of propofol till Michael passed away. I didn't even know what it was. Uh, the more I learned about it, the more outraged I became right. that anybody would give this to him. Yeah. Because apparently it induces a sleep-like effect without your body really sleeping. 
So you'll wake up thinking I had a good sleep. Your body never had a good sleep. And your body starts wasting away for lack of sleep. And it's very dangerous, dangerous to the respiratory system, dangerous to your heart. Why would anybody be giving him something like this? And the more I learned about it, the more angry I became. Well, 10 years after that, in 2019, HBO puts out Leaving Neverland. And Wade Robson and James Safechuck were the two main people in this documentary. Wade took the stand on Michael Jackson's behalf in your trial. And James Safechuck, I guess, was around as well during the trial. And you had talked to him. And I guess both sides had spoken uh, to him. I never time. spoke to Mr. Safechuck. Oh, you did? Okay, my, my bad. But he did file a, he did prepare and sign, or I shouldn't say, I don't know if he prepared it. He signed a sworn declaration basically saying he was never molested or anything of that sort. Yeah. Wade Robson, I talked to, I called as a witness. Um, I called his mother, I called his sister. Um, I'm still shocked that these two would allege what they've alleged. Now, I've never watched the movie Leaving Neverland. I refuse to watch it. I will not dignify it. I'm outraged at what I've heard about it. Well, and then Wade Robson and James Safechuck are actually suing the Jackson estate. Yes. Even though they claim it's not about the money, it's about the money, obviously. When you sue someone in civil court for money, it's about it's money. It's about the money. Right. A lot of people will say, well, it's really principal. But if that's true, why are they asking for a large sum of money? Exactly. And I guess the Jackson estate is actually suing HBO. Yes. You're not involved in, in that at all, are you? Uh, a little bit. I'm little special bit. counsel to the Michael Jackson estate. Aha. Okay. And I may very well be involved in that okay. case. Does it look like they're going to win that? Oh, I think so. I think <laughs> okay. so. <laughs> well, then in 2015, you represented Suge Knight. Yes. How did you get on that case? You know, I got a call from a young lawyer who was representing Suge and wanted me to have dinner with him, and I did. And he said Suge Knight would like you to consider defending him. And one thing led to another. And for seven months, I represented Suge Knight. Uh, then I had a falling out uh, with various people, and I basically withdrew from the case. But, you know, Suge was always decent to me. Very bright guy, uh, very creative, a lot of leadership ability, uh, very talented man, and always treated me well. I have to say that. But there were some differences that developed. They're confidential, and I'll leave it at that. But uh, I only have decent things to say about him. Well, I mean, the case kind of focused over a situation in Compton where he goes to uh, the film set of Straight Outta Compton movie. During the course, an altercation breaks out and he ends up running his car uh, into uh, Clee uh, Bone Sloan, who was beating him up at the time. He runs him over, but then he ends up also hitting Terry Carter, which was his friend and ends up killing him. Um, Suge Knight said he acted in self-defense. He did. So you think he acted in self-defense? I think it was pure self-defense, and I'll take it a step further. I think if a old white lady had been driving that car and did what Suge Knight did, they'd be giving her a medal in downtown Los Angeles for mm. what she did instead of charging her with murder. I think he was charged because he was Suge. You were originally on the case, and then Stephen L. Schwartz took over, and then uh, Thaddeus Culpepper replaced uh, replaced him, and then uh, Antoine D. Williams, uh, Jamal Tucson, and Jeremy Lessam took over the case. And I believe some of the lawyers ended up getting indicted, right? You know, I don't know what they did or didn't do. I know I never did anything wrong, right. and nor would I. Um, I won't comment on those cases because I really don't know much about them. Well, ultimately, September 2018, uh, Knight pleaded no contest to voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison, 22 years running over the victim of six years because it was a third strike. Do you think that Shug should have taken it to trial? I thought it was very defensible. I really did. I did too. I thought it was very, very defensible. Look at that tape. You know, it appears that people are surrounding Suge. Uh, what is Suge to do? He never gets out of the truck. He never uses a weapon illegally. He basically was attacked and he got out of there. 
and unfortunately someone was fatally injured, another person was injured, survived, uh, what is Shug supposed to do? Well, I think what they were saying was at the moment that he backed up, he could have just gotten away. Instead, he ended up ramming the guy that was that was beating him up, Bone. And well, then take, the a process, look, take a look at the whole tape. It appears that people are starting to surround Shug. Mm-hmm. And Shug knows the territory. Shug knows the neighborhood. Shug knows who these guys are. And Shug takes off to get out of there. And mm-hmm. I think it was pure self-defense. Well, I remember I interviewed uh, Reggie Wright uh, Jr., who was, you know, had a security at death row at one point. And he was talking to Shug around that time. And what he explained to me on camera was that not only was Shug facing that situation, but he was actually facing three different felonies. Because there was other, there was the whole thing of uh, threatening uh, the movie director. And there was also like the taking of the camera. So from Shug's point of view, what I was told was that he had to beat three different felonies because it was his third strike and then potentially three more appeals to avoid that third strike in life in prison. So that's why he ended up taking that plea deal. You know, again, I wasn't involved in the plea bargaining that went into that. Uh, I don't know what the reasoning was. He was facing some other cases. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately he took the plea deal 22 years. He was eligible for parole in uh, July of 2037. Have you talked to him after that case? I have not. Gotcha. Well, then you end up representing Bill Cosby. Yes. Okay. So in December of 2015, three uh, class two felony charges uh, for aggravated indecent assault were filed against uh, Bill Cosby in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. So this was based on allegations by Andrea Constant from a situation back in 2004. And I guess Constant and her attorney, because originally that case was sealed, right? And they had actually filed a motion to negate the confidentiality agreement because they said that Cosby had engaged in total abandonment of the confidentiality portions of the agreement. And a judge actually ruled that releasing the sealed documents was justified because of Cosby's role as a public moralist in contrast to his possible criminal private behavior. Number one, do you agree that these documents should have been unsealed? Let me say this. The Cosby case is on appeal. Mm -hmm. It's in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. They've already had oral argument, and we're waiting for a ruling. I don't want to say anything that could affect what the Supreme Court does or doesn't do, but let me say this. This was the most unfair trial of my career. Consider the following. First of all, they did not file the case in time. It's what is called a statute of limitations issue. You have to file a case in a certain amount of time or you can't file it at all. We did our research and proved they didn't file this case on time. We filed our motion and all our evidence and the judge refused to have a hearing on statute of limitations. That's what we call a jurisdictional issue. Um, The case should never have been tried. There was no jurisdiction but the judge wouldn't even have a hearing on that. Second of all, the prior district attorney of Montgomery County testified under oath that he made an agreement with Mr. Cosby's prior lawyers that Cosby would not be prosecuted, and because he was not gonna be prosecuted, he should take a civil deposition. And that former district attorney to this day maintains, I entered into a binding agreement not to prosecute him. There was a hearing on that agreement, and the trial judge ruled that the former DA was incredible. Now, what was the relationship between the trial judge and the prior DA? They had been political opponents for DA. It had been a vicious, nasty campaign. So all of a sudden, you've got two opponents. One guy wins DA. He enters into an agreement not to prosecute Bill Cosby which he to this day says was a binding agreement. His opponent who lost becomes the trial judge. Then there's a hearing on the binding agreement and the trial judge decides his former opponent was not credible when he said I entered into a binding agreement. Hmm. This issue is before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, okay? There's another problem. And that is that the judge allowed five other women 
to get on the stand and claim they'd been sexually assaulted. None of these cases were ever prosecuted. Some of them were 30 years old. Now, if somebody says 30 years ago, Bill Cosby assaulted me, tell me how we're supposed to defend that. Right. Can we find forensic evidence 30 years later? No. Can we find the witnesses 30 years later? No. Can we reconstruct what exactly happened 30 years ago? Of course not. So why are you allowing five women, none of whom were in criminal cases against him, to come in years later and testify in a case that involves someone else as the alleged victim, not them? It was purely done to prejudice the jury. It was purely done to deny Bill Cosby a fair trial. And if you put all of this stuff together, it was the most unfair trial I've ever been part of. Well, the first trial, which ended in June 2017, was a mistrial. Yes. Right. So the hung jury, yeah. So then a retrial was set. Yes. Um, and at that point, that's when he hired you to represent him in the retrial. Yes. In the first trial, the judge let one other woman testify against Bill Cosby, one other woman in addition to the alleged victim. When I showed up, he allowed five women to testify along with the alleged victim. It was clearly an effort to make sure there was a conviction by the trial judge. How was your initial meetings with Bill Cosby? Oh, he's a del- Bill Cosby is a delightful person to talk to. Mm-hmm. He's very intelligent. He's very funny. He's very engaging. He's a very respectful person of other people. He's one of the brightest men I've ever met. And it was delightful to interact with Bill Cosby. I just wish he hadn't been in this situation. And he certainly doesn't deserve to be in prison and didn't deserve to be convicted. Well, on April 26, 2018, a jury found uh, Cosby guilty of felony sexually, sexual assault on all three counts. Each of the three counts carried a prison term of up to 10 years. When you heard the news that he lost when you're, you know, because you were in the, in the courtroom. How did you feel? I felt horrible. I felt it was a total injustice. I felt the trial was so unfair, so prejudiced against him. I felt he, he had been denied due process. Uh, I felt race had something to do with it, although I could prove it. Um, and I was very, very upset. How did Bill Cosby react when you were sitting next to him? Bill Cosby is one of the most courageous people I've ever met. He's a man of absolute impeccable character. He basically took it in stride, never complained, didn't come out blaming other people for it. He's a real man of character. Well, on June 15th of that same year, he ended up firing you. Well, I mean, I lost the case. Right. Uh, He brought in another team. He has since brought in another team after that. And he has that appellate team, which I'm not part of, which is hoping, hoping to overturn the conviction. And we're waiting for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to rule. Right, because on September 25th of 2018, he was sentenced to three to 10 years in state prison. When you heard the sentencing, what did you think? I felt so sad because the man doesn't belong in prison. He's 83 years old. He's legally blind. In my opinion, he's not guilty. He shouldn't have been convicted. And uh, I feel very bad for he and his family. So the appeal was was actually filed June 25th of 2019. So why is it taking this long to kind of go through the appeal process? Well, I'm not part of the appellate team and I'm not an appellate lawyer. I'm a trial lawyer. I typically don't do post-conviction work. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you've got to get the entire trial record, all the trial exhibits. The appellate lawyers have to go through it with a fine tooth comb. They have to prepare a brief. They file the brief. There's a schedule where they file a brief. The prosecution files their opposition. Then the petitioner files their response to the prosecution's opposition. It goes before a court of appeals. Uh, There's oral argument. They rule. And then in this case, the court of appeals denied his appeal. And then his appellate lawyers appealed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, who was entertaining his appeal right now. And from what I can see, the oral arguments went very positive for Bill Cosby, but we won't know what, it, what the final result is till we get their, uh, their ruling. Okay, so Bill Cosby might be let out. He could be. <laughs> I hope he is. Well, and then in uh, September 18, 2020, uh, Danny Masterson, 44 years old, who was known for his role on the 70s show, 
Uh, prosecutors allege that he raped a 23-year-old woman sometimes in 2000, sometime in 2001, a 28-year-old woman in 2003, and a 23-year-old woman uh, on the same year. Um, and you end up representing him. I am Danny's lead counsel. I don't want to discuss the facts of the case. We're in the middle of the case right now. The only thing I will say is he's pleaded not guilty. He's a wonderful client, wonderful father, wonderful guy. And we intend to prove he's not guilty. Well, the women that are accusing him, are they still anonymous? I don't want to say anything about them at this point. Fair because enough. we're in an ongoing case. Got it. Uh, we're going to prove he's innocent. Got it. In terms of some of the other high-profile cases that are happening right now, for example, the Derek Chauvin trial, uh, did you follow that? I did. What was your take on that trial? That tape of the white police officer sitting on top of the deceased is among the most haunting, the most sadistic, the most monstrous tapes I've ever seen. You're watching someone with power sit on top of someone with their knee in their neck who's handcuffed, who can't escape, can't move, and you're watching the life slowly snuff out of George Floyd. It was horrible. But I'll say this, as horrible as that tape was, the case was even worse than that because you have that tape, which I think is enough. I think it's enough to prove murder. In addition, you have senior police officers testifying against Chauvin. You have a battery of expert witnesses, use of force experts, medical experts, a cardiologist, a pathologist, all showing why this was murder. I thought he should have been charged with first degree murder. First degree murder is premeditated murder. But in a first degree murder case, there's a jury instruction, which is that there is no amount of time required for premeditation. It can happen over a long period of time, or it can happen in an instant. And in my opinion, Chauvin had nine minutes and 29 seconds to think about what he was doing. I thought he should have been charged with first degree murder. Do you think that the Derek Chauvin conviction is a turning point in America in terms of police getting away with murder? Well, not getting away with murder. I mean, he was convicted of- Well, that's what I'm saying. That after this case, it sends a signal to police officers everywhere that they can't get away with murder the way they have been essentially for hundreds of years. It's always been very hard to convict a police officer of murder. Jurors don't want to believe police officers are capable of this. And jurors want to believe that police officers are there to protect them. And good police officers are. I mean, look, let me be honest. There's nobody I admire more than a courageous, honest, honorable, disciplined, well-trained police officer. Officers, look, they protect us every day. But if you get a dirty cop or you get a criminal with a badge, like we saw with George Floyd. That's a disaster because look at the power they have. Look at what happened there. You've got bystanders horrified by what they're seeing, a mixed martial artist, an EMT. You've got young people, older people, all saying, stop this, don't do this, telling the police officer, you can't do this to somebody. They're horrified. And the officer just sits there and lets the life slowly and painfully and sadistically ebb out. I mean, it, it's, it's horrifying. Um, it's the right result. I think it's a watershed case. I think it's going to send shockwaves through the country. Don't be a bad cop. Don't be a dirty cop. And train these people better than we're doing. Because now police officers will testify against other police officers. It's the first time I'd seen anything quite like that. Well, on the same day that uh, Derek Chauvin was convicted of murder uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, a police officer ended up shooting 16-year-old uh, Makia Bryant. Did you watch that video? I didn't see that video, no. Okay, so you're not familiar with the case? No, but I'll, let me say this. <clears throat> How can so many young people be shot at in routine traffic violations? How can it be? Well, that wasn't a, a traffic violation. No, but I mean, you're seeing young black men pulled over and end up dead in routine traffic stops. 
I mean, how can this be? There's got to be something radically wrong with the system. Why are young black people being shot because they don't have a tag that's up to date on their license plate or you can't see the license plate? How can shooting someone be the option for a police officer in routine traffic stops? It just doesn't make sense to me. Something's radically wrong. I agree. I agree. Have you been following the R. Kelly case at all? I have a little bit, yes. Okay. And the R. Kelly case, there's some similarities to the Michael Jackson case, not in terms of innocence or guilt, but in terms of a documentary triggered an investigation. You know, in, in Michael Jackson's case, he had a documentary. Now they're surviving R. Kelly. From your point of view, do you think R. Kelly is going to beat it or do you think he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison? Well, I met R. Kelly one time. Oh, really? I was very impressed with him. Very bright, very, very interesting guy, very nice guy to talk to. Um, I don't know the facts well enough. Um, I don't know what they did to bring these charges. I mean, is there government misconduct? Is there government overreaching? Is the government leaning on witnesses and threatening witnesses? I don't know. I've only followed it from a distance. He's presumed innocent till proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I extend everyone the presumption of innocence. I think that's the society we live in. There you go. There you go. Well, what some people may not realize is that apart from all these high profile uh, celebrity cases that you take, you actually do a lot of pro bono work. We actually go down south and represent people in murder cases on your own dime. Well, I've been going to the state of Alabama for 23 years, every year taking at least one homicide case for free. A number of them have been death penalty cases. Some of them it was strictly life in prison, which was the ultimate punishment. But I've been doing that in Alabama for 23 years. I did one pro bono death penalty case in the state of Mississippi as well. And 23 years ago, I met two young lawyers in Birmingham. They were up against it. They were defending a high profile death penalty case where their client was a homeless black man charged with murdering a beautiful white girl from a prominent family. And every time there was a court appearance, you saw the black face and the white face in the, on the headlines. Uh, there was a lot of racial tension over the case. They asked me if I would help them. I said I would. I went down and we acquitted our client, which resulted in a lot of tension, a lot of antagonism in the city. In fact, my dear friend, Charlie Salvaggio, who recently passed away, I'm still upset over that. I'm devastated over his passing. He was a character. He grew up dirt poor Italian in a black project. And when he was growing up, the rednecks would call Italians the N-word like they would call black people the N-word. He grew up dirt poor. He was a truck driver. He was a roofer. He was a construction worker. He was a DJ. And he saved money and he put himself through a local college and law school. And he became the top criminal defense attorney in Birmingham. And he and I just bonded as close friends. So every year for 23 years, he would call me and say, would you help me with this homicide case? And I rarely said no. I don't think I ever said no once. Mm. So I always did it pro bono. But after our client, the homeless black man was acquitted, Charlie went back to his office and there were death threats on his office machine. And he went to a local television station. He brought the message machine with him. He played it on television and then pulled out his gun and said, you know where my office is. <laughs> and that's who Charlie Salvaggio was, my dear friend. Mm. As I said, he just sh shockingly passed away a few months ago and I'm still devastated by it. Yeah. But we did, uh, we did that case. We did a fellow who was on death row for six years for a double homicide, got his conviction reversed on a technicality. We went to trial and defended him and he was acquitted. We, in 2015, had a very high profile murder case in Bessemer, Alabama, which is about 40 minutes outside of Birmingham. Our client, a fellow named Charleston Wells, was a young gang member who was charged with murdering an Iraqi war veteran who was coming out of his home early in the morning to jog. Uh, a wonderful veteran of the military who had two wonderful kids. Um, he was gunned down. They claimed that some black gang members were breaking into cars and murdered him. And they claimed that our client 
was the shooter. So we went to trial in Bessemer, another very tense, high-profile case. I put Charleston Wells on the stand. He explained how he grew up, hard on the street, how he got jumped into a gang, what he had to do. But he looked at the jury, he said, I had nothing to do with this. I didn't shoot anybody. I didn't have a gun. I didn't want anybody to shoot anyone. I didn't know anything was happening. I did break into cars. So they convicted him of the car burglaries and acquitted him of the murder which was very controversial. In fact, a few days later, on about 300 doorsteps in the area of the courthouse, the Ku Klux Klan had laid down brochures saying, rise up, Whitey. The N-word got off, this kind of thing. A very tense environment. Yeah, I bet. You know, you, you go through the South. I, there's so much about the South I love. I've seen judges and lawyers and some of the one, most wonderful people I've ever met. You also have your redneck element that is very racist and um, shouldn't be functioning the way they do. Well, yeah. I mean, besides going down south uh, to do the pro bono work, you have a free legal clinic in Los Angeles that uh, gives free legal advice to the poor. Um, You have free services for women recovering from abuse, free representations for death row convicts in Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, You march with the women of Watts. Um, You've gotten awards from the city of Los Angeles and other groups. So it almost seems like everything, (laughs) everything you've done on the high profile side, you've done as much or more for people that we don't know about, that we've never heard of, who can't afford to hire you and and give you those big paychecks. Well, for years, I volunteered at free legal clinics in South Los Angeles, First African Methodist Episcopal Church, Crenshaw United Episcopal Church, West Angeles Church of God. These churches would have various clinics where they invited lawyers and paralegals and college students and activists to donate their time to counsel people in trouble. And I did that for years. And after the Jackson case, my name was big. So I started my own clinic. It started at Brookings AME Church and then jumped to a couple of other churches through the years. Um, But basically it's a clinic where lawyers, law students, college students, activists, all donate their time on a weekend to counsel people, whatever their problem may be. It can be a civil problem, it can be divorce, it can be a business problem, it can be a problem with an estate, or a criminal problem. It's called the Mesero Free Legal Clinic, and I'm very proud to, uh, to be behind that. I also, there are a number of organizations through the years that I got involved with. There were wonderful organizations a lot of people don't know about. There's a group called Save Our Sons, at Crenshaw United Episcopal Church. It was started by Dr. Dolores Aline, an African-American woman who was the first African-American female to graduate from the University of Louisville Medical School. And she has a son who was wrongfully convicted and is in prison. And in, in response to this travesty of justice, she started an organization called Save Our Sons that's formed by black mothers whose sons are incarcerated. And Years ago, they used to ask me to speak about the drug laws, about other facets of the legal system. They would have job fairs where convicted felons could find out what jobs were available, so I helped them. The Women of Watts was started by my dear friend, Lydia Friend is her name. She lives in Watts. Uh, I've been doing that for 16 years. It's an annual march, usually in June. We march through the projects. We stop where a young person has been gunned down and say a prayer. Uh, The route changes every year. Uh, It's to focus attention on gang violence, to focus attention on the need for peace. It's led by children and their mothers through the projects. I've done that for 16 years. And there's some other organizations I've helped out when I could. My dear friend Kay Colson, who worked at Terminal Island, the federal prison for years, and then retired and called me up one day and said, I want to start an organization to help women in recovery women who are getting out of jail or prison to help them find a way to live productive lives. Would would you help us out? So I used to help them out. There's an award they give in my name uh, to a young person who's shown interest in the community and done good deeds and shows a desire to excel. They're focusing more on homeless children lately. And other organizations I've helped from time to time, I do what I can. I'm just a human being, so I've got a practice, and I've got a family, and I've, I do what I can do. Well, uh, Tom Mastro, such an interesting career, and your involvement with 
these huge cases that I really feel has sort of changed the legal course uh, of America um, is really something to be proud of. And, you know, like you said at the beginning, regardless of a person's actions, they all deserve to have good representation. And that's something that you have done for many years now, both for the rich and famous and the poor and disadvantaged. And, um, you know, you're still going strong. You're still, you know, have your, your foot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the legal field. And uh, I'm really just looking forward to what else you got coming up. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. And you've asked wonderful questions, and I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Until next time.